Welcome to Chapter One this evening with Craig Sylvie. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Craig, I'm just going to say welcome because sometimes it's a bit weird when you have to just sit there for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The reason we're chatting to Craig this evening, we probably would any time, but uh, he has written one of my absolute favourite books of the year, if not the decade, and that is Honey Bee. And um, his most famous novel, obviously, was Jasper Jones from 2009. Uh, we won't really touch on that so much tonight because that's all, you know, a lot of people know a lot about that book. I did actually test, um, I looked up the sales figures for that one <laughs> last night, actually, in Australia, and it sold just in Australia over 270,000 copies, which is quite phenomenal. And I have read that it's 800,000 worldwide, which is a phenomenal success, which is my way of saying we're very excited to have you here for Chapter One this evening, Craig. Thank you so much. How does it feel to have your new novel out in the world? Oh, it's, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for that, Kate. I'm excited to be here and looking forward to chatting with you about Honey Bee. Um, yeah, look, I'm feeling a bit of everything, to be honest with you. It's it's a nervous time, uh, it's anxiety induced, feel very vulnerable when you release a novel. Uh, but the responses so far have been astonishing. They've just been really quite phenomenal, very moving. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I feel very fortunate, I feel very blessed to have so much support. Excellent. And we are going to go through, I want to chat to you about so many different elements of this novel um, soonish, but because we are chapter one, we have, of course, asked Craig if he could read a small segment from the first chapter or the whole first chapter. You go for it, whatever you feel like doing this evening, um, and well, then we can have a good chat about it afterwards. So here you go, Craig Sylvie reading from Honeybee. Indeed. Uh, well, it depends how much time you got. I don't think I'll read the whole chapter, um, uh, but I'll read a couple of pages uh, from chapter one, of course, uh, which is called The End. I wasn't cold, but I was shivering when I walked on to the Clayton Road overpass. I wasn't scared either, even when I climbed over the rail. I didn't really feel much of anything. It was late at night and it was quiet. No cars went past. I looked down at the road below. It was a long way down. I focused on the spot where I would probably land between the white line and the brown gravel. I wondered if it would hurt or if I would die straight away. Then I wondered who would find me. Maybe it would be a truck driver or a shift worker. I felt bad for them. I must have been thinking about things for a while because when I looked across to my right, I saw a man down the other end of the overpass. He was smoking a cigarette. I could see the orange end glowing in the dark. I got nervous. He was probably walking his dog or something. I didn't want him to come closer. I closed my eyes and let go of the rail, but then I realized it would be awful if he saw me do it. I decided to wait. I looked back at the man from under my hoodie and I noticed something that I hadn't seen at first. He was on the other side of the rail too. I wasn't sure what to do. I knew I should call out or say something, but I didn't have the courage. He ashed his cigarette and flicked it. I watched it spin in the air and hit the road below. When I looked back up, the man was staring at me. I turned away. I felt like I'd been caught out. I heard his footsteps walking towards me. He didn't rush. I shuffled across and kept my head down. I thought about falling then and there, but my mind got really crowded and I froze. And I flinched when I heard his voice. I'm not here to talk you out of it. I was still looking down. Don't come any closer, I said. Righto. I guessed he was a couple of meters away. Just stay there. I understand. He was calm. I sneaked a look at him. He was old. He had a short gray beard and he wore a dark wool jumper and gray pants. He leaned on the rail and looked down at the road. He didn't say anything else. I edged further away from him. He didn't move, but it felt like he was following me. I couldn't stop shaking. My teeth 
were clacking together. My head was still throbbing from before, and there was a high-pitched ringing sound in my ears. I felt so panicked and dizzy that my mind floated outside my body, and I could see myself from above. Everything went still, and nothing mattered. It was peaceful and silent up there. I watched myself lean forwards, and that's when I dropped. I'll leave it there, Kate. Wow, what an opening. I'm interested in, I mean, it's such a dramatic beginning and it's somewhere where we're like sort of thrust straight into the story and wondering who these people are. We're wondering who the protagonist is, who's seen through the eyes of eye. We're wondering who it is that he sees up on the bridge. Was that always how the book was going to begin? Or did you ever consider that that might be maybe a further on part of the novel? No, I always knew that would be my my opening. Um, uh, and it was these two contrasting characters meeting. You know, we've got Sam Watson, who is a young trans teenager, and we have Vic at the other end of the bridge, who is an old uh, war veteran, uh, a widower, uh, who is, you know, at the end of his tether. He's exhausted. He's tired. Um, and it was these contrasting figures meeting which... Uh, was kind of the ignition point for, for Honeybee. It was a moment where I knew I had something substantive enough to, to build a story on. Um, so, yeah, there was no question that was always where it was going to start. And I have heard that part of this idea came from a real thing that, that happened. Can you tell us a little bit about the sort of true story that inspired this this moment? Of course, yeah. Uh, the, and the, 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 uh, the beginning of Honeybee stems from a, from a real event. The truth is, a few years ago, my brother was picking up his partner from the airport and bringing her home to Fremantle. And as they crossed the Canning Highway overpass here in Perth, through the corner of his eye, he saw uh, a young person standing on the wrong side of the rail, uh, and they were precariously poised. And so he immediately pulled over and called the police, while my sister-in-law got out of the car and approached them largely with the ambition just to distract them while help was on the way. And after he called the police, uh, my brother contacted me and I was at home at the office and I was working, but I felt immediately connected to, to this moment. I was really worried and I was really heartbroken and he continued to give me updates. And so my sister-in-law, whose name is Sam, uh, she approached this young person and they talked about everything and nothing until they volunteered the reasons why they were there. And the truth is they were struggling with issues surrounding their gender identity. They had lost the support of their family and their friends and they'd been kicked out of home. And so they were alone in the world uh, and they were in a really anguished and hopeless and helpless place. And soon after the police turned up and they dragged this young person back over the rail. They deposited them in the back of an ambulance and my sister-in-law was uh, just dismissed, really. She just drifted away from the scene and they drove away. And in the following days, we wanted to reconnect with this person. We wanted to, to check in and offer our support and see how they were. Um, but unfortunately, they had a really common name and we couldn't find them. They proved to be pretty elusive. And so for me, uh, I had a curious situation where uh, there was a very real person that I had a very real concern for, uh, somebody who had a very real and urgent uh, problem, um, but who existed entirely in my imagination. Uh, I, you know, I never met them. And so I wanted to understand them better. I wanted to understand the, the, the forces and the pressures that led them to that place that night. Um, and I, I wanted to understand uh, the emotional context that, that underpinned that experience. Um, and that's when I started uh, developing Honeybee as a, as a story. And I think uh, Vic is such an incredible character and I want to sort of talk in a fair bit of depth about him. But firstly, you were just talking about how you really wanted to experience, not experience, but like get inside what could that possibly be like? And I know that you um, have mentioned that you've sort of spoken to the trans community and those kind of uh, non-binary communities to sort of form the basis of some of the, I guess, ideas around 
which helped you to sort of articulate that character and what they might have been going through. Can you tell us a little bit about about that? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, you know, I, I, when I started Honeybee, my first intention was to honour that person that mm. night, um, not to tell their story, but to to honour them. Mm. And what I wanted to capture was the the uh, how it feels. What I, I wanted to to try to capture the the emotional complexities of. Uh, of, of what that person will be going through. Um, and I am acutely aware that Sam's story is not my lived experience. Mm. Uh, and so it's always been very, very important to me when illustrating a, a narrative that doesn't emerge from my own history, that I do so with respect and sensitivity uh, and understanding and above all consultation. And mm. so what it required of me was to listen and to learn and to collect testimonies. Uh, so I, uh, I, I availed myself of, of, of people's stories. We live in quite an incredible time where uh, some very brave and inspiring people have you know, publicly offered their, their experiences and their stories online. Uh, so I scoured websites and forum posts and blogs and video logs uh, and, and all of the above to, to collect people's stories. But more importantly, I was able to connect with support networks like Transfolk of WA, and I met with members of the trans and gender diverse community uh, who were so generous and so gracious in offering me their time uh, to describe their experiences, uh, to speak about their intimate histories, uh, to answer my many, many questions. Um, and so in that respect, it was a chorus of voices uh, which built Sam's character, which, which underpinned her journey. Uh, and it was that collaboration, it was that contribution from those people um, which built Honeybee. Mm. Uh, as it relates to, you know, descriptions of dysphoria or uh, uh, anything relating to, to, to Sam's gender identity, uh, nothing was left to invention in Honeybee. Everything was informed by that research and reportage. And so in that respect, I really owe a great debt to the people who uh, gave me their support and encouragement and belief uh, because we built this book together. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, I'm still engaged with those people uh, and, you know, I owe them a great debt. Mm. I think one of your absolute skills as a writer is the emotional depth of your work and I have to say with Honeybee like I cried because I was sad and I cried because I was so happy and joyful in the one novel and I'm really interested in just unpacking for a moment about getting to those emotional depths of like whether it's Edie or whether it's um, what Sam's going through at home or a lot of the different situations that happen throughout the novel. How do you know as the writer, when you've hit that that note, that note that is going to make people feel all the feels, is it something that you can you can you can see that that's that's working, or is it something that you need to hand a few people, get them to read it first? How, how do you know that you've hit the right emotional kind of touchstones? Yeah, it's 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 something you hit, you need to have an instinct for, but mm -hmm. I suppose the 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 first barometer is whether you feel the feels too. Um, and, you know, if I feel emotionally connected to a story, then, um, you know, I, I feel more confident that, that that might transfer to a reader. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that I, I don't think I've ever felt as connected intimately to a story as I have with Honeybee. And I think I owe that to Sam. You know, I owe it to, to her voice. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a really disarming, really raw narrative voice that guides us through this story. Um, there's something interesting about Sam in that she is quite untruthful to a number of characters in the story. She lies to people. She's a little bit manipulative. She's guarded. Um, you know, she's careful with people. However, she never lies to us. It's mm. quite confessional. She almost confides in us. At no point does she ever uh, come across as an unreliable narrator. And so in that sense, it feels very intimate. It almost feels like a diary entry um, where she's, she's confessing things to us. It's very raw. And so I think, I think that just breaks down uh, the barriers between reader and, and 
text. Um, and it just allows us to, to connect so much more strongly. Um, well, that, that's at least my suspicion, I think. That's, that's why it works. Yeah. And when she's on that bridge from the part that you um, kindly read out to us, the, you know, in the, the true story behind this, it was the one person who was there having a, you know, really terrible moment. I am interested in the character that you've chosen to meet him on the bridge, meet her on the bridge, I'm sorry, um, is Vic. And I'm interested in, you know, was there a time where you thought that he, it would be someone on the bridge who wasn't also incredibly troubled themselves? Um, you mentioned Vic as then also being a very calm character. So can I tell you, can you tell us a little bit about how you built that character of Vic and what that character needed to sort of, what role that needed to play in the book and how you sort of achieved, you went set about achieving that. Yeah, you're right. It, it, um, it's a good point because uh, this Honeybee actually began its uh, narrative life as a, a one act play. Um, and uh, I, I sent it off to my good friend, Kate Mulvaney, uh, who is just eternally delightful. Um, and she read it and, you know, it became abundantly clear that I should really leave theater to the thespians. Um, <laughs> But, you know, she she said that there's more there. You know, there's something substantive here, but this just isn't, isn't the right vehicle for it or she just wanted more. Um, and so it, I sat with it for a little while. And, you know, at, at that stage when I wrote the play, it was a much different character that met Sam on, on, on the bridge. Um, and it was when I conceived of Vic, a very contrasting character, somebody at a, at a, at a different stage of life, somebody coming from a different generation, having different experiences. That it was that contrast between the two of them that uh, excited me mm -hmm. and led me to believe that there was a story there. Um, and, and that that relationship between the two of them, quite an unexpected one, um, could be enough to, to, to carry a, a novel. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I love Vic. Oh, I so really do. Yeah, I have so much admiration for, for him. Um, it's interesting because in Honeybees, for, for Sam, masculinity is seen as a threat. It's something to be feared. It almost operates as a kind of antagonist in, in the story. But in Vic, I think we see uh, in the traditional sense uh, some of those admirable traits of masculinity. Um, you know, he's a protector and a provider and he has a heart of gold. Um, I'm certainly not suggesting that that these virtues can't be embodied by women, but you know, in the traditional sense, he's you know uh, he's a he's a masculine character, um, and uh, you know, Vic lives his life through this sort of system of moral laws that's kind of codified in his behaviour, and it influence it influences what he does before he considers his wants or desires. You know, he's quite rigid in that sense, and it's really uh, quite dignified which isn't to suggest that Vic is without his flaws because um, mm. he has many. Mm. Um, we actually learn a lot about Vic through his departed wife, Edie's mm. diaries. Mm. Um, and in those diaries, which Sam later reads, uh, she describes Vic as a rock. And this is true in a couple of senses. One in that he is very strong and very resilient and very consistent, but also he is impermeable uh, you know, he is very quiet. He suffers in silence. And I think this is quite true of a lot of men in that generation. Uh, and it's certainly true of a lot of return servicemen. Mm. And so what the relationship between Sam and Vic offers us is that Sam gets the blood from the stone. Mm. Vic opens up. He confides in Sam. He's vulnerable with Sam and it changes him. It redeems him. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really, I love that thread of their relationship that they both improve each other's lives. Yeah, so do I. And I think there's also that element of uh, maybe for Sam that Vic being such a masculine character, um, it, he, he accepts Sam for who he is in a way that other people had not prior. Um, yeah. And that is played out in that um, Sam sort of, finds Edie's amazing vintage wardrobe and loves getting dressed up and uh, 
he, he expects when he sort of gets found out that this is going to be Vic's just going to kick him out of the house. There's no way, you know, and the opposite is true. And, you know, so I think maybe that element of the masculinity also is really important in that relationship. Yeah, Sam feels safe and protected. Um, and, and Vic is the first person that Sam ever encounters that uh, doesn't judge her for uh, for who she really is. Mm. And, you know, there's something really special in that. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing for Sam to adjust to. Sam comes from a really neglected household, very inconsistent, insecure, quite a volatile background, you know, and she's raised by a single parent um, who smothers her with love and then retreats and retracts it. And mm. it's very confusing for Sam. She's, she's distrustful of relationships for, for that reason. Um, and so, when she meets Vic and has this very consistent, very solid, very safe, very protective person uh, in, in her life, um, it's difficult to adjust to. But you know, she—I don't know. She she loves Vic. She she comes to really appreciate that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And th through that sort of Vic takes Sam to go and see a drag show. <laughs> and this is I have to mention this part this is not really a spoiler I just had to mention this part because it is one of the most fun scenes I've read in a really long time I absolutely love love this scene and it almost it just the tone of the novel really shifts in this scene um I live quite close to the imperial here uh in the inner west oh, wow. I've been to many of these drag shows and I'm like how did he nail the drag show <laughs> um but I'm interested in um the writing process around that and the character building um we often we're, we're introduced to fellow bits Gerald who is competing for my favorite character alongside Vic uh can you tell us a little bit about the writing of that scene and 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 how you sort of got into that mode and created this sort of vibrant vibrant experience for the reader yeah absolutely i mean i have always loved drag i just adore it you know it's it's just so fun and it is subversive and satirical and rebellious and riotous and it's just endlessly entertaining to me i just love it um and so yeah it's it's sam's ambition before she dies to see a drag show and uh it's it's vic's ambition to to help sam live that dream and so um you know off off they go uh to a, to a drag evening and in in writing this scene um i wanted to capture the idiosyncrasies of perth drag um mm -hmm. you know so i wanted all the gossip all the kind of local patois um uh anything that i could collect to to distill what perth drag is and so I did enlist the support of uh, a couple of local queens. Um, one tour guide was, uh, went by the name of Sky Scraper. Uh, <laughs> it was just wonderful, all six foot five of her. Yeah. And she was great. You know, she, she, she taught me a bunch of stuff, uh, you, you know, uh, everything about Perth drag to where, you know, uh, all the various nooks and crannies from which glitter can emerge. Um, you know, it was, it was great. But one thing I did learn uh, that interested me to the extent that I had to include it in the book uh, was this kind of caustic rivalry between drag queens and hen's nights. I found that really <laughs> interesting. So Honeybee, Honeybee is set in uh, 2017. So this is before same-sex marriage legislation was, uh, uh, was passed. And it was interesting to me that... Um, hens would favor LGBT venues, particularly drag clubs. And I understand why, because it's a safe space for them. It's, you know, they don't want to go out and be harassed. They want to go out, cause a ruckus and, uh, and have a good time and, and feel safe themselves. Mm -hmm. However, it struck me as particularly tone deaf, and disrespectful to go out and celebrate nuptials in a house where that right wasn't afforded most of the patrons, you know? Uh, and so this notion of the drag queens in Honeybee uh, having this kind of distaste for hen's nights, which culminated in this really savage takedown uh, from one of the queens as part of a kind of comedy set, uh, I really delighted in, in writing that. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so, yeah, being able to design my own drag show was a real hoot. I really enjoyed it. I have to say it was harder than 
I anticipated to come up with new drag names. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Slim Busty is probably my favorite. Slim Busty, yes, <laughs> I was pretty happy with that. Drag. I mean, there's nothing better than drag shows where they have the really Aussie accents and Slim Dust, and Slim Busty is just <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I can hear totally. Busty, in, Busty in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so when I came up with Fella Bits Gerald, I was very happy with myself, Kate. I'm not going to lie to you. I had some fist pumps <laughs> at the desk. I was, uh, I was pretty happy. Yeah, definitely. I'm also interested in the music that plays in the, the show that they put on because you've got your classics like um, Deltra and Lady Gaga and Kylie, but you also have It's Oh So Quiet by Björk and you also have um, PJ Harvey and Joan Jett. Can you tell me how you went about choosing those songs? Is it just because you love them or? <laughs> A little bit. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. But it's strange when you work in popular culture references into into a novel because you've got to be really careful about what's maybe going to date, what people can um, can immediately latch onto and be familiar with, and so you don't want it to be too lame, but you want it to be uh, kind of uh, impressed enough into into popular culture to be immediately recognisable um, and to have some endurance, hopefully. So you don't want it to date too quickly. And so I really agonized over the song that, uh, you know, that we latch onto in that particular scene, which is tri quite a triumphant moment. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was something I agonized over, but, uh, you know, I think, it will, I think it will endure. And, you know, Fella Fitzgerald's song as well, uh, you know, she sings I'm Through With Love, um, which is a great Ella hit from... Uh, <laughs> And I just thought it would be a really beautiful moment and quite a contrast to the rest of the show, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm really careful about those things that, that go into the book. We do need a honeybee playlist. I right. the dream is Sue, Bob. <laughs> Bob and me in there. We definitely have to do the playlist. Actually, you you make the playlist, write a few bits of that. We'll definitely put that on the Dimmicks blog. Um, <laughs> totally, yeah. Let's get on to that. <laughs> that sounds so fun. Um <laughs> A lot of the characters in the book, and there's still a, a bunch more characters that I haven't even mentioned. I'm I'm assuming there were other characters that you wrote that then you cut out because it's such an A-list of characters that make <laughs> it into the book. Um, but I'm really interested. I want to I wanted to talk about all of them, but I do definitely want to talk about uh, Vic's neighbor Aggie and the role that she plays in Sam's life. Can you tell us? Uh, can you introduce us to Aggie and tell us a little bit about her? Oh, I certainly can, uh, and I'll be delighted to do so because I really adore Aggie. She's great. Um, so Aggie lives, yeah, she lives on the same street as Vic, and uh, she notices Sam when Sam goes to stay with Vic and almost immediately adopts her as a, as a best friend. It's almost as though Sam has no choice in the matter, mm -hmm. and uh, Aggie just sweeps her up into, into her life. And as I mentioned, you know, Sam comes from a really different background. Uh, the Mima Doomers uh, are a very stable, very consistent, uh, very middle class mm -hmm. suburban nuclear family. And so when Sam gets swept up and invited inside, mm -hmm. it's quite exotic to her. You know, she's mm -hmm. never experienced a dynamic quite like it. And so it takes her a long time to adapt. It takes her time to adjust to the fact that these people are just kind and very supportive and very enthusiastic. But Aggie in particular, you know, Aggie is vivacious and charismatic and wildly opinionated um, and she is an unrepentant nerd. Um, you know, she loves Dungeons and Dragons. She plays the euphonium. Uh, you know, that she's got all those things going for her, you know. Mm. Um, but I think what Aggie offers the most other than, uh, you know, unsolicited advice and, uh, you know, overwhelming love, is that she offers Sam uh, perspective. And so Sam, by virtue of being quite isolated and alienated, has kind of grown up with this contorted vision of herself. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's full of doubts and it's full of self-loathing. And, you know, she doesn't have a very high opinion of herself. Mm -hmm. Whereas this person who sweeps her up and immediately just loves her for, for who she is, um, it's quite confounding. And over time, uh, you know, it's Aggie's impressions of Sam uh, that become a huge catalyst for change. And it actually happens the moment where 
uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, before you embark on a new game, you fill out these things called character sheets. So you select a character and you imbue a character with all manner of attributes. And because Aggie's a complete geek, she fills one out for Sam. Character she is, and she describes her as chaotic good. Um, and when Sam gets this character sheet, it's almost like meeting a stranger. She's so far removed from who she truly is. Um, and when she be, when she comes to appreciate that, it's a real agent of change for, for her. And I think that's what relationships and support can offer us. You know, I think it's a really important part of, of growing up. And I think it's a really important part of welcoming people into your life. And sometimes the important part as well is, well, I guess the part that plays out very well in a novel is Sam doesn't always listen to the advice and it's not like oh well you've got some great characters around you so now I'm just going to do all the right things <laughs> there's yeah. many, many points of the novel where you're like oh Sam you, I don't know if you should ah you know these kind of things which makes it for so much incredible dramatic tension and and between these incredible characters and you, you know as a reader you appreciate exactly what they are and Sam does too but it's just sometimes he's just not ready to, <laughs> to <be laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I love that. I love all those tensions in the novel. I think it's amazing. I also wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who's making these amazing comments. It looks like a lot of people have, have already read and enjoyed and loved the book. Um, and, yeah, I'm loving all these comments. So we're going to open up to some questions very, very shortly. Um, but I wanted to um, ask a couple of extra things. I wanted to ask a little bit about, um, I mean, in Jasper Jones, one of the major characters is a teenage boy as well. I mean, you're obviously not far off being a teenage boy, right? In your 20s. Yeah. I was interested in, yeah, <laughs> I was interested in what draws you to these, these characters um, sort of at very influential points of their lives. Do you have any insight into that? Yeah, I mean, I guess I am essentially still a child, um, <laughs> at, at least, you know, emotionally. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure why I, I, I'm consistently drawn back to this period in our lives. Mm -hmm. I think it has something to do with the fact that the best novels, from, to my mind, exhibit change. Mm -hmm. And our adolescent years, our teenage years, are almost universally um, a period of great upheaval. Mm -hmm. You know, they're very definitive. We're working out who we are and mm -hmm. why. We're working out how on earth we're going to fit into a world that now seems outside the bubble of childhood, seems broad and vast and overwhelming. Um, we're experiencing things for the first time. So mm -hmm. everything is amplified. Everything is uh, uh, dramatic and, and big. And so it's a fascinating period of our lives to, to, to kind of cover. Um, you know, every teenager goes through a period of change. Um, and Sam in particular, there, there is for Sam a particular terror in developing. There's a particular fear uh, in seeing her body uh, develop in a direction that doesn't uh, represent who she is. Mm -hmm. And so there's an urgency behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, it's these, uh, it's these core relationships that uh, imbue her journey mm -hmm. and give her hope um, that that serve as the real backdrop to, to this story. And so it's a really interesting period of our lives, I think, to, to, to cover. Mm. I um, mentioned that this, a, a few of the amazing characters within the book, and I, I feel like everyone I've spoken to who's read and loved the book cites a different character as their favourite character. <laughs> I've already said that I think, you know, mine is Vic and I also think Fella Fitzgerald is also amazing. Do you have a favourite character and why, Craig? <laughs> yeah, oh, my goodness. I, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. You know, I, it's, it's a bit like trying to choose your favourite child or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, you know, I think I just feel very intimately close to Sam. Mm -hmm. Um uh, you know, I, I feel like we kind of went on a journey together and, and uh, you know, I feel like she guided me as much as I guided her. Um, I've, I've never quite had an experience like it with, with, a, with a character. And, um, you know, it was tempting sometimes to want to make decisions for her which uh, were more sensible, 
you know, more reasonable would would uh, not impact her safety, but it wasn't true to her character. And it's rare for me to be in that position, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, I feel very, very close to to, to Sam. And and um, you know, I, there, there might be I don't know, there might be more to come for Sam Watson. Who knows? Oh my god! Okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's event number two, I think. I don't even know if we can go there. Um, I want people to start to ask some questions for Craig that I could call out. But in the meantime, I'm really interested in, I know for Jasper Jones, you toured a lot and you toured the country and you did a lot of events and those kind of things. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference in this experience where, you know, you can't travel across the country? How How's this been for you? Yeah, it's been a little bit of both, you know. I think I mentioned to you privately, I feel a little bit like a distance education kid. You know, I'm sort of mm-hmm. tapping in from uh, this whole of the planet to, to connect with readers and, and speak with people about it. So there has been a period of some adjustment, but it's really lovely being able to, you know, to, to chat and still connect with people through Zoom or Facebook or, or whatnot. I have been really fortunate being here in Western Australia where we have physical events um, with uh, not, not too rigid uh, restrictions. And so it's been a real joy to, to get out there and speak with readers and, um, you know, meet them and, and, and talk to them about the book. Um, you know, obviously it's disappointing, a bit disheartening that I can't traverse mm-hmm. the nation and speak to people, but I'm ever hopeful that next year, uh, you know, I can get on a plane again and do some events and speak to people. Absolutely. And I mean, this, the book is selling like hotcakes and for absolutely good reason, but I feel like next year, you know, that's just going to be still reaching new audiences constantly. I mean, that's what we're definitely going to see with this. Um, Do we have any questions for people? Otherwise, I'm just going to start ranting about how much I love this book. Uh, What research, thank you, Joanne, uh, what research did you undertake for Vic's character development? Yeah, that's a good question. I I think Vic is uh, sort of an amalgam, I suppose, of men that I've known, uh, of, uh, of, of, stories that I've read and, and people that I've encountered. I've, I had known a couple of return servicemen, um, you know, whose philosophy has been, you just don't talk about it. Um, Vic's a byproduct of a lot of men in my life. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so in Honeybee, uh, you know, after, after Vic's wife Edie passes away, Vic closes the door on their marital bedroom. And he never walks in there again. It's too difficult for him emotionally. And it's actually the room where Sam goes to stay. And it's like a museum to their love. Um, nothing has been changed in there. It's, it is as it was on, on that day that he departed. Um, and this is actually true of my grandfather. Uh, when my grandmother passed away, he closed that door and he never went back in there again. Uh, he went. He slept in a sleep out, and and that was that. That was that was an area of the house that he never, for the rest of his life, never never went back into. Um, and I found that really heartbreaking. And I found that also quite indicative of uh, of how men of that generation will often cope with emotional duress. Um, you know, for better or for worse. Um, but I also found it as a kind of profound testament to their relationship and their love. Um, uh, you know, he wasn't a very effusive man, my grandfather, uh, but there was something really quite profound in that gesture, which uh, spoke to me a great deal. And so, you know, I, 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 it felt natural for me to want to give that to Vic. It felt like something that uh, he, he might adopt. Oh my god! If anyone hasn't read the book out there, this is the kind of goosebumps you get when you're reading a book, <laughs> listening to Craig tell the, the true stories. Um, we've got another question here from Karen. Uh, the chapter names are brilliant and insightful. Are you particularly pleased with one? Oh, thank you, Karen. That's very nice of you to say. Um, yeah, a lot of thought went into the into the chapter titles for for Honey Bee. Um, I will say that I do have a particular affection for one chapter in particular and, and, and one chapter title, and it's the chapter called Cinderella, um, and it is the, it's the drag night chapter. Um, I think without wanting to beat my own drum, um, it's the best standalone chapter that I've ever written, really. Um, I, I think it, it, it comes together exactly as I had hoped, um, and I think it's conceptually uh, really quite strong. I think you could pull that chapter out 
of Honeybee and read it separately and I think get enough of a narrative uh, to, to, to really paint a picture of this world. Um, it's almost like a little novella, I think, that, that chapter. Um, and, you know, the little fairy tale element and the nod to Cinderella, I think, works really well. So I'll go with that. <laughs> um, while we're waiting for another question, I have one that I've been dying to ask you, actually, and that's about uh, Sam's love of cooking and Julia Child and how she uses this um, in her relationships with others and, and, and what that means to her. Can you tell us a bit about Totally. That? Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, um, I love Julia Child. Um, <laughs> so, Sam, as I mentioned, Sam comes from a really uh, isolated background and um, her main portal into the world is through a stolen iPad. And one day she stumbles across on YouTube, uh, uh, you know, this amazing woman who has uh, a cooking show who just is so intimate, so welcoming. She just speaks directly down the camera and just brings you into her kitchen. And for Sam, who lacks nourishment in so many areas of her life, be that emotionally or the fact that the cupboard is bare, um, this is uh, wildly seductive. You know, this, this doddery old aunt who speaks directly to you in a kind of sing-song voice, um, who is free to make mistakes without ever scolding herself or getting angry. You know, Julia Child will drop a frittata and just pick it up and plate it up anyway and pour herself a litre and a half of wine and just, you know, uh, and have a good time. <laughs> She's she's just a really wonderful woman. Um, and so Sam just gets obsessed with Julia Child and watches every episode of The French Chef, which I pretty much also did. Um, and it gets the obsession gets to the point where it's almost like Julia Child becomes her guardian. Sam mm -hmm. starts to talk back to her and, and they have this kind of relationship and she uh, seeks her out in for comfort in moments of distress. Um, but most importantly, almost by osmosis, Sam learns how to cook. And uh, cooking becomes a few things for Sam. One, it's one of the few ways that she uh, can reliably ignite this sense of confidence in herself. Mm -hmm. She's good at it and she knows that. Um, and so it's a, you know, it's a really beautiful thing that she has. Um, but it's also, given the fact that she finds difficulty in uh, describing her emotions to, to other people. It's how she lets people know that she cares for them. Mm. It's uh, if, if, if Sam loves you, she will cook for you. If Sam, mm. uh, you know, holds you in high esteem and wants to, wants to keep you, um, you know, she will cook for you. Mm. And, uh, you know, it becomes almost her main aspiration in, in Honeybee is, is to, is to cook and to, and to be a chef. Um, and yeah, she owes that to Julia Child. Amazing. I wanted to eat the food too, so it's very effective. But Lisa's asking here, um, how long did it take to write Honeybee? Yeah, so first draft I think would have taken two and a half years or thereabouts. Um, and then the edit uh, I think took maybe between six and nine months or thereabouts from, you know, the structural report to, to the line edit, et cetera. Uh, so maybe three years all told. Yeah, wow. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> and I mentioned before, which is while we're waiting for another, oh, no, here we go, we've got one. Carly uh, says, if the movie was made into a film, who do you think would play Sam? That's a brilliant question. <laughs> right, well, uh, the, the good news is that producers are circling um, and we're not <laughs> actually too far away from uh, uh, building the offers and making the decision. It's actually looking like Honeybee will be a series drama, so it will probably be television, which will allow the characters a bit more time to flourish and develop and maybe some subplots, et cetera, um, and maybe even future seasons, who know, which which would give us maybe more Sam Watson. <laughs> um, uh, I, the, the truth is that um, that Sam Watson, the, the, the actor right now, uh, is probably about nine years old and has no idea that they're about to be casted. So... Um, so it's a bit hard to say who's going to play Sam at this point in time, uh, just because development takes a little while. Um, but, you know, I have some ideas for, for sundry characters. You know, for example, I would adore uh, Hugo Weaving to play Vic. I, I think that words work really well. Um, so, you know, if someone could put a line out to Hugo, we could, uh, we could get that ball rolling. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. It'd be really. I love casting. It's it's the most important part of of adapting for screen. Um, so I'll be really interested to see who we come up with. Yeah. And is there anyone watching now from one of the film companies being like, damn it, it's TV. Oh, there's still time. There's still time. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, got, we got Sue here saying, did you think of an alternate ending for the book without spoiling it for people who haven't finished? Was there a different way it could have ended? Oh, wow. That's an interesting question. Um, I have to say no. No, I didn't. I mean, I didn't conceive of the ending uh, when, when I'd started the novel. You, you, you're never quite qualified to, to know that yet. So you have an idea of maybe where the story might be heading uh, and what changes might take place, but there's always room in the margins for a story to, to weave and weft and, and go where it will. Um, and so by that virtue, you, a, a story almost moves of its own accord and it tells you how it's going to end. You, know, you sort of discover the ending as you write. Um, and so I'm never really in a position where I feel like I'm contending with four different options for an ending. Um, you just wait and you persevere and, uh, and then you almost intuitively know that moment where the, the ending emerges in your thoughts and you just know that's where you're headed. Um, and usually that doesn't happen until you're at least halfway through or well into or heading towards a third act. Mm. Well, given the conversation that we just had as well, it might be that there's another ending to come. <laughs> there's lots to come, yeah. Um, and we've got Joanne who say, Honey Bee helped get me through the second lockdown in Victoria. Has your reading life been affected by COVID and has reading helped you get through it? Awesome question. Yeah. Oh, hello, Joanne. I'm, I'm, my heart goes out to you. I'm so sorry that things have been tough over there in Victoria. It's, it's, it's really tricky. Um, you know, I've been really heartened, though, by the fact that in a time of calamity and isolation that so many of us have turned to books. You know, our industry have, has stayed, um, you know, profoundly important. And uh, I think it's because stories help us feel connected. It's, it's different to being online or being able to uh, maintain relationships online um, because it's more intimate, I think. I think we reach for books in, in times where we feel alone because, you know, reading is a solitary act that helps us connect to other people and live other lives, you know. Um, with that said, uh, I'm just getting back into the habit of reading. The truth is that while I was writing Honeybee, I read very little. Um, uh, the, the, the fact is that when you have a narrative voice that is as delicate as Sam's, you don't, well, I tend to be very protective of it. And so I don't want anything influencing that. Um, and so I, I, you know, I had a dry spell of almost three years where I really didn't read too much at all. I read some scripts and uh, some nonfiction stuff, but I've been out of the loop with fiction. So I'm just starting to eat it back up now uh, that I have a little bit of time. Um, so yes, yeah, so COVID has helped me uh, read a bit more for sure. That's wonderful. I think we're probably almost out of time. We've maybe got time for, we've probably gone over time, but we're having such a good chat that let's just keep going. I think we've probably <laughs> got, <laughs> we've probably got another question in us. But in the meantime, oh, here we go. Lee, Leanne, uh, thanks for this. What's your creative process? Special room, regular hours, journal? Uh, everything except the journal there, Leanne. Um, yeah, I have a I have an office uh, which I attend to pretty much every day when I'm when I'm obsessed by a narrative when I'm when I'm cultivating a novel. Um, so I'll work a an afternoon session from between twelve and five pm or six. Then I'll break for dinner and I'll cook something. Uh, I'll reacquaint myself with my partner and I'll try to relax. Mm -hmm. And then uh, then I'll do another session from about nine pm to about one or two am. And uh, and I'll do that about six days a week, um, and that typically is is, is how it works. Um, I'm very monastic in my approach, so uh, you know my my desk is usually quite spare. There's no lights allowed in the room, bleeding from the windows. There's no music, um, uh, because the truth is that you need to allow yourself. You need to allow your thoughts to to drift into a space that lets you create from a place of some purity. It's hard to describe, but a writer needs to 
inhabit the same sort of dreamlike meditative space that we as readers uh, drift into when we're immersed by a novel. You know, when we're, when we're spellbound and mesmerized by a story, um, we lose all sense of our own identity. We don't know who we are. We don't know what time it is. We don't know where we are. We lose all sense of appointments we might have or, or any of the intrusions of the everyday life. And we exist inside this imaginary space that we're creating as we comprehend and interpret these words. And so an author needs to get themselves into that space, into that dreamlike space, but they need to make it up at the same time. But you also need to reserve enough of yourself uh, to record it. And so it's a really tricky line to traverse and it takes time. If nothing else, you just need to persevere and be determined and really stubborn and rely on little rituals and routines to allow yourself into that space that a story can unfurl of its own accord. Mm -hmm. um, you can try to write from outside that space, but it's never as pure and you often find yourself editing it out afterwards. Um, when writing really works is when you almost feel as though as a writer, you're a conduit or a spectator in your story and it happens kind of organically, if that makes any sense at all. Um, yeah, and so it just takes a lot of time. Yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, we've got last question, but in that sense, when you knock off work, like I get home from work and I say, oh, this thing happened today and, oh, the, you know, big book didn't show up on time and blah, blah, blah. Do you walk out of your office, reacquaint yourself with your partner by saying, do you know what my character did today? <laughs> or do you <laughs> sort of keep that in your mind, in your own sort of space? Yeah, the, the, the truth is, unfortunately, it's really obsessive. And uh, my brain is a particularly difficult one to, to turn off. Um, yeah, an author lives a couple of lives, really. You live a private world where you displace uh, real life in favor of a fictional one that you're cultivating. And uh, your imaginary cast of characters takes precedence over the, you know, the, the real people that you're uh, intending to be a reliable part of their lives. Um, and so it displaces everything and you live kind of locked into this, uh, this strange um, penumbral space where you kind of have a foot in both doors. Um, and, it's, and it's tricky. It's difficult. It makes things difficult to, to kind of manage sometimes. But then that private world changes and there's a transition point and it's when your story becomes one of these, becomes a book. And so the private world becomes a public one when an author hands their story over and gives it to readers and appreciates that it's not theirs anymore. It's for readers to interpret and make their own. And it's, it's a really beautiful part of my job, handing a story over to, to, to see what kind of trajectory it might have or what, uh, I don't know, what conversation might emerge from it. Uh, the scope and sophistication of how people might connect to it. It's really fascinating and it just gives my working life meaning. So thank you to everybody who supports my work. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, congratulations and thank you for bringing us such an amazing work. We've got our last question this evening from Marg. What is the next book from you, Craig? Oh, thanks, Marg. I'm glad you're looking forward <laughs> to the next one. Um, the next project, I have to say, would probably be uh, working on the adaptation for, for Honeybee. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'd expect to be uh, a, an executive producer uh, and I'll be part of the writing team. I'll, I'll be head writer, so I would, if it is television, I'd probably work on uh, a few episodes and certainly be part of that, that writing team that, that brings the story to life. So that'll keep me pretty busy. Uh, I do have a novel that's kicking around in the back of my head, uh, but I can't really speak too much about it. I, mean, I could talk around it for about 15 minutes and make no sense, but... Uh, Suffice to say, there'll be another novel and you won't have to wait 10 years for it, I promise. <laughs> and hopefully in the television show, we'll see you kicking in as like one of the guys in the bar or <laughs> someone come along to see the drag show. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll just moonlight as a drag queen. Well, I might have to shave, yeah. but, uh, you know, I can see a cameo there for sure. Slim, slim busty. 
We'd love that. We'd love that. Um, I want to say a huge thank you, Craig, Sylvie, for joining us on Chapter One this evening. We wish you all the best with this novel. Um, I'm sure everyone who's listening is entirely convinced if you haven't read it already, you should absolutely go and grab a copy of this first thing tomorrow morning. Um, it is one of the best novels. It's Dimmick's book of the month. Uh, we absolutely love it here at Dimmick's and make sure you also buy it for like every single person you know at Christmas too. That's a really good idea. Um, but Craig, a huge thank you for taking the time to speak to us this evening and the best of the luck with the novel. Oh, thank you, Kate. I really, really appreciate it. And, and thank you everybody to, for tuning in. It was really wonderful. Great chat. Yeah. Great. So tune in to another Chapter One soon. I've got one on Monday night with Dolly Alderton. So looking forward to that as well. Thanks a lot, guys. Good night.